I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, too. You know something interesting? I'm not sure that I do. Well, I do. We have a little canary at our house, and I stuck my finger in the cage, and the canary bit me. It did? Yes. Can you imagine a little teeny weeny canary biting a big, great, big person like me? That is amazing. But I know something else that's kind of strange, too. What? Well, today, on the page which has Believe It or Not by Ripley, there's an interesting fact. About a canary? No, it's about a swallow and a butterfly. Tell me about it. Well, a man named David Thompson says he saw a butterfly that chased a swallow away. You mean a little butterfly with its little spin little legs and soft wings chased away a real live swallow? Yes. And you know a swallow is a much larger bird than a canary. And it's a much, much bigger thing than a butterfly. Yes, I'm really surprised at that. I thought you would be. Well, you look at Believe It or Not by Ripley and see it for yourself. I always look. I like Believe It or Not by Ripley. He tells very interesting things. Yes, he does, doesn't he? And there's lots more interesting things I'd like to find out about in the funnies. Puck the Comic Weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read them in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> it's a rainy day at the Army Post where Beetle finds most of his troubles. Beetle and a squad of men are busy cleaning up the grounds in a steady downpour of rain. Beetle's sergeant exclaims, Oh, what a headache. Hey, Beetle, run over to the dispensary and get me an aspirin. Yes, sir. Beetle trudges over to the dispensary, the place where you can get aspirin tablets. He sees a sign tacked on the door. Closed after 3 p.m. All cases will be treated at the hospital. Oh, rats. The hospital is three miles from here. Third picture, Beetle, now soaking wet from the rain, approaches the hospital. Darn, I'm getting a blister on my foot. Last picture, top row, Beetle enters the hospital and approaches the desk. A man carrying a stretcher knocks Beetle in the head with it. Ow! Oops, I'm sorry, Mac. Beetle stands groggily by the desk. But before he can ask for the aspirin, the girl there tells him, uh, Take that seat by the door and wait your turn. Beetle goes over to the seat by the door, which is next to an open window. People come in, and people go out. And every time the door is opened, the wind blows through, creating a draft. And Beetle, who is soaking wet, gets chilled and begins to sneeze. <laughs> it's you! Well, by now, Beetle is feeling pretty rotten. He's worn out from the three-mile walk in the rain, his head aches from the hit in the head, and he's awfully cold from sitting in the draft. He leans back and puts his hand on the windowsill to steady himself. Oh! The receptionist hears Beetle's groan, and seeing him shivering, comes over to him. Uh, I better close this window. And she slams the window down on Beetle's hand. Oh, well, just a minute. I'll open it so you can get your hand out. And she opens the window. And Beetle bends over, holding his aching hand. Just then, the door behind him opens, knocking Beetle out of the window. And last picture, Beetle is in the hospital again, this time in bed. His leg is bandaged, hung on a stretcher. His hand is bandaged, and he's thoroughly sick. And the nurse is saying to the doctor, He said he just needed an aspirin. And the doctor replies, Brave lad, won't admit how bad off he is. <laughs> oh, poor Beetle. All that trouble 
trouble just to get an aspirin tablet. Yes, and now he's lying in the hospital all bandaged up. He really gets into trouble, doesn't he? He really gets into trouble, doesn't he? Yes. Well, now what would you like to read next? Oh, I'm anxious to read Peter Pan because John and Michael are in Neverland and they're going looking for the Indian. Oh, yes, yes. Well, let's turn over the page then. Go past little iodine. Oh, and look. Here on page three is Prince Val. And you remember last week, little Arn, who had been lost, was found by a woodcutter who lived in the forest. Yes, does he take little Prince Arn home again? Yes, he starts taking little Arn home, and Sir Gawain, who was looking for little Arn, meets them. And he takes Arn onto his horse and rides back to the castle to his father and mother. Oh, well, I'm glad he's home safe and sound. Yes, he is. Well, now let's turn over the page. And look, here on page five... Peter Pan. Oh, yes, Peter Pan, that cute little fellow who lives up in the strange land called Neverland. Yes, Neverland, where little boys and girls never grow up. They just stay little boys and girls so they can keep playing all the time. Hmm, that's fun. Well, that's what's happening today. Well, today, John and Michael and all the other boys in Neverland are on their way searching for the Indians. I wonder if they find them. Well, let's read and find out right now. Here we go with Peter Pan. Say the magic words with me. Pirates, Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Neverland. While Peter Pan and Wendy visit Mermaid Lagoon, John leads the lost boys in a search for the Indians of Neverland. Away they march, following John, their leader. We're following the leader wherever he may go. We're at the fight Indians because he told us so. Suddenly, last picture, top row, in a little grove of fir trees, John stops. Hey, what is it? What is it, huh? What is it, huh? Well, look. And John points at the ground with his umbrella. Hey, footsteps. Yes, Indian footsteps. Hey, gee, what do you know about that Indian footsteps? Yeah, Indian footsteps. Hey, look at that. What's your Indian footsteps? First picture, bottom row, John says, Gentlemen, we must plan our strategy. The initial phase is an encircling maneuver. And as John explains his plan of attack on the Indians, little Michael is the only one who sees the fir trees closing in. Now, then we simply surround them and take them by surprise. Little Michael sees the fir trees moving closer and closer around the boys. He exclaims, Hey, John, John! But it's too late. Hands reach out from the fir trees, and the boys are captured by the Indians. Me got them. John's plan for a surprise attack on the Indians turns out to be a real surprise on the boys. And last picture, the little hunters, now prisoners, are hauled toward the Indian camp. Oh, isn't that too bad? Those Indians were hiding in the fir trees, and, and John, who was the leader, didn't see them. No, he was so busy keeping his eyes on the ground, looking at the footsteps, that when he looked up, it was too late. Oh, I wonder what the Indians will do to the boys. Tie them to the stake? Well, that's something we'll have to find out next week. Now, let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, my favorite, favorite, Donald Duck. And we'll read your favorite, favorite right now. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald gets a phone call from his girlfriend, Daisy. Yes, hello. Oh, Donald, I'm at Minnie's. Will you run over to my house and take my wash down? I think it's going to rain. Oh, well, okay. A few minutes later, Donald is at Daisy's house taking her wash off the clothesline. There's a clap of thunder, and then it begins to rain. Uh Uh-oh. Donald sweeps the last piece of clothing off the line, tosses it into a basket, picks up the basket. I'll just make it to my place. And he dashes for his house. He doesn't see a telephone pole which is running his way. At last picture, top row, Donald picks himself up, starts tossing the scattered clothes back in the basket as the rain pours down. And then he dashes for his house again. Second picture, bottom row, he stops on his doorstep. He searches in his pockets. And then he exclaims, Drat, my key, I've lost it. He hears the phone ringing, so he dashes around the house. Opens a window, climbs halfway through, 
fix up the receiver. Hello? Oh, Donald, this is Daisy. I'm just calling to see if you got the wash in before it rains. And last picture, Daisy hears... <laughs> what a temper. Yes, what a temper. <laughs> Poor Donald. He tried so hard and he didn't get the clothes in out of the rain after all. And after all the trouble he had, I don't blame him for losing his temper when Daisy called that second time. <laughs> no, I don't either. Well, now look across the page. There on page seven is Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, Roy Rogers. You remember last week, Roy saved his friend Dolfo Hawkins from being killed when the outlaws tied Dolphal up and threw him in the wagon and they made the horses hitch to the wagon run away. Yes, you see, the outlaws wanted to kill Dolphal, but Roy rode up just in time and stopped the horses and saved Dolphal's life in a nick of time. And then little Tim, that's Dolphal's nephew, who was riding Trigger, rode back to the outlaws, and now the outlaws have captured Tim again. And I can't understand why Tim had to go and get himself captured. Well, he's a very strange little boy. He has some crazy idea in mind, I think. So let's read now and find out what happens next. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by <laughs> Tim has boldly galloped up to the outlaws and putting on an act begins to cry, saying that his uncle Doleful has been badly hurt. The outlaws had expected Doleful would be killed. They gallop back down the road in the direction Tim came from, taking Tim with them, now a prisoner. Bullwhip says, I thought we took care of Doleful Hawkins when we spooked his oil wagon team toward breakneck her. Pharaoh, the leader, answers, Well, something must have gone wrong, Bullwhip. At that moment, they gallop under an overhanging bluff. Suddenly, two figures leap from the bluff onto the outlaws. It's Doleful who tackles Creaky, knocking him off his horse. And Roy, who drops between Pharaoh and Bullwhip, jerking them to the ground. All right, now we'll take care of you, Pharaoh. Roy quickly leaps to his feet and swings at Bullwhip. All right. Bullwhip goes reeling back, first picture bottom row. Pharaoh scrambles to his feet, whips out his gun. All right, hold it, Rogers, or I'll blast you wide open. Tim pulls out a water gun and squirts water in his eye, spoiling his aim. my eyes! With Bullwhip and Pharaoh out of the way, Roy runs after Creaky, who's knocked Doleful down. He whirls Creaky around and has the drop on him. All right, Creaky. The sheriff wants you and your pal Bullwhip for the murder of Doleful's boss. Last picture, Creaky stands hands up and says, Fancy Pharaoh made us kill Hank Branton so he could grab the company's ore hauling contract. Suddenly, Doleful exclaims, Hey, Roy, Pharaoh's getting away, and Tim's taking out after him. We've got to stop him. <laughs> It certainly was. And the way Roy knocked that bullwhip down and saved Dolfo just when Creaky was just about to hit him with that rock. Oh, that Roy Rogers. He's really some fighter. Yes. But now that Tim is going to get into trouble again, yes. just look at him galloping after a grown-up outlaw all by himself. Well, we'll find out next week if he gets into any more trouble. And we'll also find out what Roy does about it. Now let's turn over to the very last page of the first section. All right. And we'll read Flash Gordon in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. riga diga doon doon saskamatash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash Gordon and Dale and their friend Zarkov were in a new rocket ship built for them by the Venusians on their way back to Earth and home. Flash noticed they were running out of fuel, and fearing they couldn't make it to Earth, they decided to land on the moon, hoping to find friends and fuel to continue. As they climb out of their spaceship, they are confronted by an armed tractor. On his receiver set in his space helmet, Flash receives an order in perfect English, obviously the voice of an Earthman. March toward the lunar base. Flash, glancing at the cannons which menace him from the space tractor, realizes they have no choice but to obey. So, followed by the tractor, Flash and his friends march toward a strange building which juts out of the earth like a large pumpkin. Last picture top row, tuned in on the tractor wavelength, Flash hears the driver radio a moon station. Mark to Dr. Stella. Rocket pilot claims to be Flash Gordon. 